Hello, folks. Uh, this is this is, <laughs> this is kind of a new thing for me. I've never really done an online conference before, so hopefully people will laugh at my stupid jokes, but I won't be able to tell. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm here to talk about um, this thing I call persistent fools, um, and I'll I'll sort of get into what that is in a second. Um, by way of introduction, this was already kind of mentioned. I'm a primarily design researcher and, and author um, based in New York right now. Um, and I've, I've, I've written a couple of books on design in the past uh, few years. Um, this talk is, is going to be about my second book uh, by the same title, which really deals with the, essentially the relationship between design and deception and manipulation um, and how we might use the logic of cunning intelligence or the logic of the trickster archetype. Um, to sort of understand that 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 interplay of deception, manipulation, and design, uh, in order to better understand it and thus uh, design hopefully more sustainable futures. Um, so that one is is book number two. Uh, the first book, Design for Design, uh, came out a few years ago, uh, which looks at the relationship between experience design and uh, phenomenology, or essentially a uh, a branch of philosophy that deals with the nature of human experience. But for today, um, I kind of have, there's, there's sort of one big premise uh, to the book and to this talk. Uh, and it's that I'm essentially arguing here that all design is deceptive and manipulative to a certain extent. Uh, but I think if we can better understand the relationship, we'll be more and we'll be better equipped to deal with social and political complexity. Um, so kind of the, the, in other words, what I'm, what I'm saying here is that if we take sort of the current state of the world as it is now, and we find that to be undesirable, um, which I would, I would imagine most of us here probably do, um, we can then take it sort of a step further and say, if we want to redesign what what these different possible futures might look like, we have to rely on a different logic that got us here, right? As Ahmed was kind of talking about this, this sort of colonialist logic, which was part of what led to what we now know as capitalism. Um, that is a certain logic. And, and I want to argue that if we want to get out of that, we need a different type of logic. And the way that I sort of sum that up is through the the frame of of cunning intelligence. So if we were to define this uh, kind of quickly, we might say the ability to transcend traditional ways of thinking to achieve a goal often rooted in deception and manipulation. So things like cleverness, right? Or, or being wily uh, in a certain sense is kind of all under this, this realm of cunning. Um, and but before I kind of I dive a bit deeper into into cunning and its its relationships, I want to I want to talk a bit about um, uh, a Greek myth of Prometheus. Um, Prometheus being one of the first kind of trickster characters that we've come up with, and Prometheus is really known for you know stealing fire from the gods, um, but he's a bit more than that. I think the Prometheus character is really foundational to our understanding of the relationship between design and trickery and deception um, and how we can use non-traditional, often manipulative tactics uh, to sort of subvert systems of power. Um, Prometheus is really intimately connected with technology um, as a figure who gave humans their first fun fundamental technology, that of fire, uh, which is really kind of a blessing and a curse. Um, because fire creates and destroys in kind of equal parts. So in this way, ambivalence is, is kind of a, a key to understanding the Promethean myths. Uh, he's a figure that creates and destroys, he gives and takes away, he loves and abandons. And one of the first stories that we have about Prometheus includes um, his somewhat lesser known brother, Epimetheus. And what's, what's interesting about these brothers is that um, their names translate into forethought and afterthought. So Prometheus, his name literally means forethought, um, and his brother Epimetheus means afterthought. 
And one of the first stories we have is, is around these two brothers being asked to assume the responsibility of creating life on earth and deciding which living things receive various traits, like the length of hair or the size of feet, um, things like that. And Prometheus uh, let his brother Epimetheus um, take on this project, which in hindsight is probably not the best thing for a guy named Afterthought. Um, but nonetheless, um, Epimetheus got to work um, and was kind of excited at the, the opportunity to step out of his brother's shadow. And he started assigning traits to all of the animals. So birds got feathers, you know, fish got scales, predators got claws, etc. Um, and the, the result of this, um, as one might be able to predict, is that Epimetheus fucked up big time. Um, because by the time he got to humans, he already gave away a lot of the good stuff. So the animals got all of the fur and the claws and the powerful jaws, the teeth, the enhanced senses, right? Something like a wolf is so, um, so adapted to their environment with these, these kinds of traits. And humans kind of seem sort of naked and, and stupid by comparison. Um, and Prometheus saw this. Prometheus came back and he, he kind of took pity on these, these dumb naked creatures and he decided to look after them. Um, he realized that humans would always be out of place in their environment, um, right? They, they sort of sweat and dehydrate in the summer and they shiver and starve in the winter. They're just not equipped to, to thrive in this world. Um, but Prometheus decided to, to try and fix his brother's mistake. And at, at this point, Prometheus situates himself as, as an outsider of sorts. Um, he's, he's not a mortal, um, but he's not really fully a god, at least in his motivations and, and intentions. He's between these two worlds and he's able to cross them um, and kind of equalize that power dynamic. So one of, one of his tasks that, that Prometheus started um, was what we now call the, the trick at Mekon. Um, and it was to teach humans how to make better sacrifices to the gods uh, and keep the good parts of an animal sacrifice for themselves. So the story goes that Prometheus gathered humans, uh, gathered the humans and asked them to procure an ox uh, for sacrifice. And humans were used to making sacrifices to these kind of wrathful gods, right, that they needed to make happy. Um, but most of the time they were left with the, the undesirable parts of the animal, like the bones and the tendons and cartilage and the stuff they couldn't really do much with. Um, and the gods would take all of the meat and fat for themselves. And Prometheus uh, sought to show humans how to use cunning intelligence really to, to get their fair share. Um, instead of overpowering a god, which humans could never do, they would have to use trickery to sort of work their way around them. Um, so Prometheus slaughtered the animal and, and he, he arranged its components into two piles. One pile consisted of the meat and the fat of the animal. Um, that he covered with the ox's innards, the uh, intestines and stomach and things like that. And the other pile was a collection of bones uh, that were said to be artfully displayed. Um, and he rubbed them with fat so that they glisten in the sun and they kind of look nice. When Zeus arrived, uh, he was asked to choose which pile to take with him. And he looked at the two piles and he saw, you know, the, the kind of beautiful bone sculpture compared to what looked like a pile of guts. Um, and he decided to take the bones. Um, so unbeknownst to him, he left humans with the meat and the fat. Um, and humans kind of took this as a lesson um, in how to use deception and cunning as a way to get ahead of the gods um, and possibly ahead of each other. Um, so of course, once Zeus found out that he was tricked, um, he was angry. Um, he punished humans by taking away their ability to make fire. So they had to sort of eke out an existence in the cold and the dark. Um, Prometheus comes back to the rescue again. He steals fire from the gods, gives it back to humans. And then the result of that, of course, Prometheus uh, gets fucked over big time. Um, Zeus punishes him by chaining him to a giant rock. Um, and every day an eagle would come and eat his liver. Um, and then at night, his liver would regenerate. The eagle would come back in the morning for eternity. Um, and I think what's kind of interesting about this story too is that like in a way the, the animals are, are almost punishing Prometheus for providing fire back to the humans, which 
is kind of the first fundamental technology, but provided a means to dominate and destroy nature um, for millennia. So I think there's a there's a few interesting things about the Promethean mix, um, Promethean myth within this context. And first is that Prometheus was was kind of the first character that taught humans how to be cunning um, and how to use deception as essentially a design method. But he didn't teach us how to do so responsibly. Um, we really have no sense of responsible or ethical deception. Um, he taught us how to rebel. He taught us that we don't have to accept things as they are and that we can, we can fight back. And then finally, he showed us uh, the ambivalence of technology through the gift of fire, this kind of creative and destructive force. So shifting a little bit, um, I want to talk about some, some sort of words and language we use within design um, using some of Jacques Derrida's work, um, a literary theorist and philosopher who articulated points around the ambiguity of language through his, his theory of deconstruction. Um, and in particular, for our purposes, I think his, his treatment of the pharmacon. Um, Derrida points out that this ancient Greek word pharmacon can mean both medicine or cure, uh, but also poison. So it has this kind of dual opposite meaning. And he uses this, this linguistic anomaly um, to show how language can play tricks on us and contradict itself and signify its opposite. And in a similar way, um, many of the words we use to describe aspects of design tend to reveal themselves uh, to be associated with deception and manipulation. Like pharmacon, um, we associate with de design with compassionate action, right? Around human centricity and benevolent action. Um, and often this association is warranted, but when it breaks, it breaks in really sort of interesting and influential ways. Um, Benedict Singleton uh, writes that the briefest rummage through the dictionary reveals, implies, that designers are not to be trusted. Um, so notice the typo there. Um, you know, to be fair, I, I quoted this from a draft paper, so it is, it is a, a typo, but I think the mistake is telling this reveals, implies, um, and I'm, I'm sort of, it makes me think like, does the dictionary uh, reveal some kind of hidden truth about design or does it just imply or seem that way? Um, and when you, when you really take a look into these types of words um, in a simple compare and contrast will illustrate Singleton's point. Um, these common designerly words have, have strange and kind of sinister connotations. Um, on the left-hand side, you see words with these designerly associations, and on the right-hand side are translations from their roots in like ancient Greek, Latin, um, Old French, and, and some other languages. So things like to devise plans and create devices is also to contrive, which has this negative connotation. Um, fabrication can mean to build, but also to lie, um, kind of equally. Um, creating the artificial, uh, inherently involves manipulation. Um, it's this idea of skillful manipulation. Designers themselves can be craftspeople. They can also be crafty. Um, and to dwell, right, what, what design tries to do, right, create a home for us in the world, um, can also mean to mislead or deceive. So the Singleton's essay and, and, and a couple of, of other essays um, led me down this path into thinking, what, what is the nature of this, this idea of deception within design? And I think given the associations within the, with, with these words um, and their alternate connotations, um, if we, can, we can conclude that, that design is not a purely benevolent force that we commonly associate with things like human centricity and creating better futures and all of this kind of stuff. And that manipulation is inherent within design. Um, something in the, in the design act is always changed or intended upon or augmented to fit our needs, right? We design because we're not home in the world. Um, we're not equipped to cope with the realities of our environment as, as kind of the Prometheus myth shows. So we have to impose changes on nature or reality or wildness or whatever kind of ambiguous and insufficient term uh, we want to give give to that concept of, of the pre-designed state. Um, another, another writer in this vein, uh, design uh, and kind of media theorist and sort of general provocateur, Willem Fusser, 
Um, Frame's design is the act of deceiving nature in attempt to elevate the human designer to a godlike status. Uh, when he writes that quote, this is the design that is the basis of all culture, to deceive nature by means of technology, to replace what is natural with what is artificial and build a machine out of which there comes a God who is ourselves. So I think despite Fusero sort of actively ignoring that humans are in fact part of nature, um, his point about this overcompensation is a strong one. Um, the act of design attempts to make up for our shortcomings, um, illustrated in the Prometheus myth. And given, given the, the arrogance of the human species, it, it can have quite catastrophic results. Um, however, this is not to say that design is inherently bad or unethical simply because it involves manipulation. Um, but I think we can rethink our conceptions of deception and manipulation to realize a spectrum uh, of manipulations and then therefore determine uh, levels of acceptability within that. So Flusser argued that this spectrum of manipulation ranges from what he called patient manipulations and violent manipulations. Um, he wrote that, quote, agriculture is the patient manipulation of animate nature. Industry is the violent manipulation of inanimate nature. It forces it to reformulate itself according to models. The farmer waits for the animal, I'm sorry, the farmer waits so that the animal and plant develop under his care in a way that is useful for him. The engineer forces raw material to be as it should be according to his projects. For the farmer, reality is an animate being put under his care. For the engineer, reality is material to be hammered, burnt, gasified. So I think looking at images like this, we, we shouldn't make the mistake of simply thinking that an image of plants represents nature while industrial equipment represents the artificial. Um, both of these scenes are, are designed. Um, they're both sort of unnatural, just to different degrees. Um, agriculture, in particular, non-industrial agriculture, um, is, is nature sort of patiently manipulated. Um, my garden here at home um, manipulates soil and plants, but it does so in a way that doesn't change their fundamental structure. Uh, it works with the constraints imposed by the natural environment. Whereas something like industrial agriculture, however, um, has been engineered to violently manipulate the environment and its constraints to fundamentally change the nature of plants through things like genetic engineering and chemical pesticides, um, et cetera, for the purposes of greater you know, production, consumption, profit. So when we see an image like this, the, the violence here is not simply to the animals themselves, um, although we shouldn't discount that there's plenty of violence to the individual animals, um, but also to our entire relationship with food. Right? The, the modern factory farm sees animals not as individual beings, but as material to be shaped and consumed. Um, food corporations have, have successfully convinced us that it's perfectly fine to take these individual beings who feel pain, form social bonds, express emotions, um, and treat them as material to be maximized uh, in kind of every conceivable way, um, from housing them in these cramped pens and feeding them a diet uh, that's not designed to provide nutrition, but to fatten them up for slaughter and, and even augment their bodies uh, to decrease chances of death prior to reaching their ideal weight. But there are ways to resist these kinds of things. And it's, I'm, I'm using the example of, of industrial agriculture here, but there's plenty of examples. Um, this activist here is, is performing what's known as an, an open rescue, uh, which entails entering a place where animals are mistreated and removing them in the open. Um, knowing that they will likely be arrested. Um, it's a spectacle. It, it aims to raise awareness and kind of send a message, right? It's, it's designed to provoke. Um, and activists who, who, who engage in this type of direct action, I think have a lot to teach designers, especially on the topic of resistance tactics. Um, I believe that designers need to be radicals in, in kind of the traditional sense of the, of the word. Not necessarily that they need to be going out and getting arrested all the time, but that we should rethink social problems at a structural, systemic, and tactical level, um, and really starting to enact change at the root, um, which is what that word radical means. It's right, it's related to radish, a root. So in this, in this vein, um, social theorist uh, Michel de Certeau um, really famously differentiated between 
strategies and tactics. And he uses them in a very unique way, um, stating that strategies are put in place by those in power to maintain the type of order from which they profit. Right? For example, the strategy of industrial agriculture tells us that chemical pesticides are perfectly fine and they won't hurt us. Um, tactics, on the other hand, are means by which the powerless resist, um, such as in an open rescue, right? the individual activist versus the entire industrial industry, um, industrial agriculture industry. So Deserteau describes tactics as, quote, clever tricks of the weak within the order established by the strong, an art of putting one over on the adversary on his own turf, hunter's tricks, maneuverable, polymorph mobilities, jubilant, poetic, and warlike discoveries. So tactics are these, these actions taken by those who can't achieve their goals by conventional and what we might call rational means, right? It's the humans versus the gods again. The humans can't overpower the gods to take the good parts of the sacrifice, so they have to use cunning. Um, they turn to this sort of poetic dance of the hunter um, and the nimble movements of the trickster to kind of put one over on their adversaries. Um, and this is really what the, the trickster does naturally um, and something that I think designers can and should practice more consciously. Um, these trickster characters like Prometheus um, have a few key components to their behavior uh, that I think are particularly useful for design and I'd like to talk about a couple of them. Um, they can help us think through resisting violent manipulation while still recognizing the inherent manipulation within design. Um, so the first characteristic of, of the trickster is, is this idea of metis, um, which is uh, yet another Greek word um, that, that translates into cunning intelligence. Um, it's very much associated with like old Greek chariot races and wars and things like that. Um, but it's a fundamental um, characteristic of trickster figures from all around the world. Um, no matter what culture um, the trickster character comes from, and there's tricksters from cultures everywhere, um, this idea of, of, of cunning intelligence is kind of universal. Um, because tricksters are unable to function in a world of, of social norms and kind of conventional thinking. Um, they operate differently. They're able to move away from conventional intelligence and rationality um, to use cunning intelligence to sidestep these strategies that were imposed on them, um, and especially to use their opponent's natural inclinations against them. So a, a classical example of this is, is the fish trap. Um, Lewis Hyde, a uh, scholar who studies tricksters, said that, quote, no trickster has ever been credited with inventing a potato peeler, a gas meter, a catechism, or a tuning fork but the trickster invents the fish trap. Um, and these, these primitive traps are used all around the world today. Um, and I, I use the word primitive, not in a derogatory way, but in, in, in a, a reverent way almost. These, um, these things are very effective. Um, they work by putting a, a piece of bait at the end of the trap um, that you can see on the right-hand side of the image um, to lure the fish inside. And once the fish gets inside the trap, um, it gets confused. Um, because it's 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 against a fish's nature to to swim backward most of the time, and even if the fish turns around, the trap is designed in such a way that it makes getting back out difficult. So instead of using brute force to sort of ensnare a fish or spear it um, or something like that, it, it relies on the fish's natural inclinations and uses those against it. A second kind of core characteristic of tricksters is their ability to adapt um, to kind of any given circumstance. Um, the, the trickster character is unable to strategize. Uh, they can't really think beyond their immediate situation, uh, which is often compelled by really base instincts like, like hunger and lust. Um, they find it almost impossible to imagine future states. And interesting in being this way, they're, they're kind of these like anti-design figures. Um, but nonetheless, they reveal problems with the common conception of design as an intentional movement toward a preferable future, right? Tricksters show us that adapting to contextual influences uh, is often more effective than planning a linear path towards a certain goal. Um, and this is, a, this is a thread taken up by um, Robert Chia and Robin Holt uh, in their fantastic book, Strategy Without Design. Um, where they, they kind of challenge this notion of con conventional strategy from a number of angles. Uh, they write here that, quote, 
Uh, collective success need not be attributable to the pre-existence of a deliberate planned strategy. Rather, such success may be traced indirectly as a cumulative effect of a whole plethora of coping actions initiated by a multitude of individuals, all seeking merely to respond constructively to the predicaments they find themselves in. So success in any situation is, is rarely the result of, of creating a plan and sticking to it, right? But ironically, this is what designers are taught to do most of the time, is to plan and then execute. Um, the trickster op uh, uh, operates through these sort of unconscious coping mechanisms to deal with these conceptual ro or these contextual roadblocks that will inevitably emerge in any kind of action, right? Like if you've, if you've designed anything, you, you probably witnessed how limiting um, and insufficient rigid plans can be uh, and how important adaptation is. Um, so at this point, you'll, you'll notice my love for alliteration. Um, the first two lines were alliterations and I kind of had to keep it going, um, but tricksters are, are sort of said to be in this constant state of flux. Um, they're almost never static. They move between the worlds of the gods and the mortals, humans and animals, males and females. Um, and this, this fluidity contributes to their ability to adapt, but it also points to their need for movement and their dissatisfaction with sort of the way things are here and what might be better over there. Um, it also illustrates their status as, as outsiders. Uh, the trickster, in a sense, is, is a character who kind of never fits in. <clears throat> I tend to think of the example of, of nomads. Um, Lewis Hyde, again, said that tricksters are, quote, the lords of the in-between, always on the road. We might liken them to um, uh, things like gatherer-hunter tribes who move around in search of food, um, hitchhikers and hobos who move around because they've never really found a place to belong, um, those who live in campers or vans because paying for a stationary home would impede their ability to travel, um, long-distance hikers who walk thousands of miles every year because these trails provide this kind of mundane simplicity you can't find in town. Um, these nomads and drift, drifters must become adept at inserting themselves into unknown situations and making the best of their status as outsiders. Um, and I think good designers do this as well uh, by finding ways to exist in situations where we might not always belong. Um, I'm not sure if amorally um, is necessarily a word, but I'm, I'm making it one because I think it means something very specific. Um, I think this is maybe the most interesting and troubling characteristic of the, the trickster is their moral and eth eth ethical ambiguity. Um, I chose to call the trickster amoral here because they're, they're not immoral, right? They don't purposefully act in ways that go against conventional morality, but they're, they're indifferent towards morality. It's like they're not affected by it. Um, they're driven by these very base instincts, right? They know what they want. They know how to get it. They're rarely concerned with like, the ethics of stealing or lying, for example. Um, when they are concerned with things like morality and ethics, uh, they serve to make us question our, concept our own conceptions of, of proper behavior. Um, take an example like Dexter, right? An American television show about a serial killer. Um, but Dexter is unique in the sense that instead of killing at random or choosing his victims according to sexual preference, like most serial killers do, um, Dexter only kills other serial killers or people that he says deserve it, um, according to what he calls this code that like his father imposed on him. Um, and the, the point here is not really to determine whether Dexter's moral code is justified, but rather to rethink our own sense of right and wrong. Um, Dexter, much, much like the trickster, points out the ambiguity and aspects of life that we tend to take for granted, right? Like murder is wrong all the time. Um, Dexter sort of calls that into question. Another example um, is the, the work of the Marquis de Sade. Um, Sade uh, is sort of a namesake of, of what we know as sadism. Um, he was a French writer uh, whose work depicted these kind of scenes of sexual violence and pleasure derived from inflicting pain on others, um, hence sadism. Um, the, the writing itself is, is quite boring. Um, his, his books are like eight, 900 pages of these very like repetitive, long-winded um, sexual scenes. And the scenes themselves that he imagines are, are quite nauseating in a lot of, a lot of um, instances, but 
the function of Saad's work, I would argue, is not necessarily to like entertain a casual reader. Um, it's to show the reader where their boundaries are and introduce these new types of moral challenges so that they might determine their own stance. Um, Saad really, I think, shows us how, shows us the trickster's ability to provoke. Um, he pushes us to our limits, essentially, which is, I think, where critical thought and where change happens. And then the last component uh, has to do with pranking. Um, the trickster is kind of an inherent um, pranker, but one who, prankster, but one who plays pranks um, that reveal new perspectives and, and kind of spark this critical thinking. Um, as Gabriella Coleman um, shows in, in her book, uh, Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy, um, what we now know anonym as anonymous uh, began with troll culture um, on the message board 4chan around the mid 2000s or so. Um, and, and trolls trolls at the time were these figures who, who operated anonymously and were mostly in the business of shock and awe, um, posting the most disturbing content they could find in attempt to one up each other. Um, but they had a, a very sort of specific cultural relevance. Um, Whitney Phillips, another researcher on this topic, describes trolls as, quote, agents of cultural digestion who scavenge the landscape, repurpose the most offensive material, and then shove the resulting monstrosities into the faces of an unsuspecting populace. Um, and, and given their anonymity, um, certain of these uh, anons, as they called themselves, uh, began to take on uh, more pointed missions to sort of scare and humiliate particular targets uh, in search of what they often called the lulls. Um, so L-U-L-Z, uh, which is of course a play on LOL, um, but, but the lulls that these, these trolls talked about was sort of a more sinister laughter. Um, it was a sense of amusement at someone's existential breakdown or, or humiliation. Um, trolls would do all kinds of horrible things, right? Releasing information, spreading rumors, um, threaten people with assault and rape, um, mock the deaths of others. So these these trolls were were responsible so, for some pretty terrible personal attacks. But at the same time, troll culture gave rise to a more sort of politically oriented movement we now know as Anonymous, who used similar types of tactics to attack oppressive governments, um, greedy corporations, um, uh, people trying to censor things on the internet. Um, and they, they, they kind of became these, these sort of anonymous um, modern day tricksters with uh, somewhat of a moral compass. Um, and they set their sights on these systems of power that were, were put in place to oppress the other Anons, right? So at, at this point, uh, a couple of things will hopefully be clear. And this is, this is kind of my last section here. Um, one is that design and deception are intimately related, and two, that tricksters are both experts in deception and ethically problematic. So I argue in the book that, that traditional ways of thinking and traditional design approaches are not sufficient to deal with the levels of social, cultural, and political complexity that we see today. Um, in other words, if we want to address truly wicked problems, right, which by definition have no, no solution in the traditional sense, we have to explore different ways of thinking about problems. And one of these ways is, is, is this concept that, that I call responsible contrivances, uh, which, which attempts to blend the, the A rationality, right? Again, not the irrationality, but the A rationality of trickster logic uh, with a more responsible design practice. Um, so I think a, a few design practices have begun to consciously incorporate these kind of trickster tactics into their work. Um, most obviously that of uh, critical design, um, which kind of aims to provoke critical thought by creating objects and experiences that push boundaries and, and introduce new ways of thinking about social problems. Um, one example of, of a, a critical design project is, is uh, a project called Tender. Um, a group of students created a display that holds a smartphone with the Tinder app loaded uh, sitting below uh, this metal shaft that holds a piece of meat. Um, and as the, the shaft rotates, the meat drags across the screen and, and swipes left or right, uh, mimicking the, the interaction um, on, on Tinder. And the, the commentary here is, is a bit on the nose, right? It's, it's kind of heavy handed. 
Um, but that sort of seems to be the point of the project. Um, if you watch the video, which I didn't include here because it, it would probably mess up the bandwidth, um, some of the more kind of subtle and, and grotesque effects start to reveal themselves. Um, like as the meat hits the phone, it makes this sort of flapping sound, um, maybe perhaps mimicking the sex act. Um, it also leaves a residue across the screen as it hits a few times. Again, maybe I'm reading into it too much, but mimicking the sex act. Um, and, you know, I really like this project because it, it seems to reduce a seemingly harmless app down to its base function, um, right? It calls attention to the fact that even with, with these high-tech gadgets and seemingly complex interactions, we've, we've really just reduced mate selection down to a technologized game of, of who would you do. Another example um, is uh, a project called Drone Shadows, um, in which the artist James Bridal creates these outlines of aircraft in public spaces around the world. Um, and they're meant to draw attention to autonomous aircraft flying overhead um, that we never really see. So the shadows themselves aim to create a sense of anxiety in the viewer as if a drone is, is passing overhead. Um, he also created an Instagram account called Dronestagram, uh, which would post a video for every, or sorry, post a photo for every instance of an unmanned military drone strike. Um, and the photo would show the area hit along with the death toll. Um, on sort of a lighter note, uh, we have things like the Japanese uh, uh, design practice of Chindogo, uh, which creates these objects that are kind of absurd, but like amazingly satisfying, right? They're sort of these like perfect solutions to common problems. Um, right, like if you want to sleep on the subway, but you don't want to hunch over on the person next to you, like just wear this hat with a plunger on the back and stick it to the window. Um, if your feet get wet in the rain, um, put little umbrellas on your shoes. Uh, or if you have a baby at home that crawls around on the floor all day, like put them to work and attach a duster to their belly and they can clean the floor as they, as they crawl. Um, and I think what's interesting about Chindogu in particular is that it kind of walks the line between humor and seriousness. Um, I think it's 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 too easy to dismiss the practice as mere play and the like not proper design. Um, but while these artifacts don't provide us from anything with anything useful in kind of the usual sense, they push us out of these these traditional, often corporate driven ways of of thinking about design. Um, so I think I think it's 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 easy to to dismiss a lot of the preceding examples of as products of privileged designers with a little bit too much time on their hands. Um, I would also, you know, I think it's fair to say that a lot of critical design projects fail to really sufficiently critique. Um, they kind of stop just short of presenting an actual political opinion. Um, but at the same time, I think if more design practitioners um, who are on the ground day to day were able to, to participate in these kind of speculative product projects, they could take that inspiration back to inform the decisions they make in their day-to-day -day work and potentially instilling a stronger sense of what design is supposed to do, right? To actually create futures. Um, so in other words, it would promote utopian visioning that I think is lost in much of modern design practice, uh, specifically by using trickster tactics uh, that were presented here. Um, of all the variations of design that exist today, I think critical design gets closest to using this idea of cunning intelligence to circumvent design strategies that were imposed on us by more commercial design endeavors. Um, it's, it's kind of fundamentally a utopian and, and sometimes dystopian practice. Um, and the, the function of utopia, it's, I think, sort of helps us grapple with this type of envisioning. Um, the word utopia is another example of how language kind of plays tricks on us in interesting ways, right? The word utopia is a, a combination of, of otopos and utopos, or good place and no place. So the, the, the utopian vision is, is both good and necessary, but also impossible. Um, it can't be realized, but it's like crucial that we try. Um, at the same time, uh, people like Nick Cernicek and Alex Williams write that, quote, utopias give us something to aim for something beyond the stale repetition of the same offered by the eternal present of capitalism. So utopian vision is, is I think the exact type of unreality we need to break from the bounds of profit motive 
um, and imagine an end to capitalist power um, or an anti slash post uh, capitalism. And I think cunning intelligence can help us with that goal. Um, the rationalist thinking of business strategy will never be sufficient. Uh, we need a different type of logic to think our way around the strategies that have been imposed on us. Um, trickster tactics like cunning, adaptation, fluidity, pranking, and even amorality uh, provide us with a framework for this kind of tactical subversion. And if we're not happy with things like social media sites stealing our data, the government spying on us, oppression of workers in the gig economy, the rise of nationalism, um, the continued destruction of ecosystems at the hands of corporate power, um, then we have to design our way around those issues um, because we're probably not going to topple um, those strategies. And I think more consumption, more business, more profit are not going to be sufficient. We need something different. Um, and to, to kind of wrap up here, I I encourage designers to embrace this type of utopian thinking and, and this idea of cunning tactics. Um, Prometheus was unable to uh, teach us ethical trickery, but I think we can take up the, the project ourselves. Um, and the logic that has led us into the current social, political, and ecological problems uh, will not get us out. We need a new way of thinking. And I think the trickster might serve as a model for this type of tactical resistance, uh, utopian as it might be. Um, and I'll, I'll end on a quote from <clears throat> um, Kyle Lesson, uh, the founder of Adbusters magazine, uh, when he says that, quote, what design needs is 10 years of total turmoil. Fuck it all anarchy. After that, maybe it will mean something again, stand for something again. And with that, uh, I want to thank you. Um, if you're interested in reading the book, it is on Amazon as well as Smashwords. Um, thank you very much for listening.